Reading with your kids. Join us right now from all over the world. I am so excited. We have members of the Catholic Teen Authors Group back again to create another, to, to, to share with us another original story they created just for the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Please welcome to the show Anthony Kolink, Leslie Wall, Carolyn Asphalt, and Corinna Turner. My friends, how are you? Wonderful. Glad Great. to be back. All right. Well, Tony, take it away. All right. St. Nicholas Eve's Carol. Tony Kolink's portion. You're not actually going to make me go, Ebby told her mom. It was the night before her confirmation retreat to be held during Advent in honor of the feast day of the parish's patron, St. Nicholas, a.k.a. Santa Claus. Who holds a retreat at Christmas time? It's ridiculous. Her mom smiled. Mr. Gabriel does like to shake things up, but he's been amazing so far. Mr. Gabriel, the confirmation teacher, had only been in the job a few months, so Ebby figured he didn't realize that most students wanted confirmation class to be as quick and easy as possible. He was also the only teacher who called her by her proper name, Abigail, instead of her nickname. There's no flipping way, Ebby told Pastel. She pulled her best friend aside after the confirmation retreat began on Friday night in the St. Nicholas Parish Hall. Mr. Gabriel had just announced the student teams for the entire retreat. Ebby had been paired with Teddy the Bear, that awkward boy with high-functioning Down syndrome. Pastel cracked up. Maybe you two will be besties, Ebby, she said laughing. As if, Ebby said, I'd rather be besties with a toad. For three years, Ebby had worked hard during religious education to finally get in with the only three cool kids in the class. Pastel, Robbie, and Destiny. She wasn't about to let Bear ruin all that effort. Her friends had always made jokes at Bear's expense. In fact, Robbie had been the one to coin Bear's nickname because he was, quote, thick and fuzzy with a head full of fluff, as Robbie had said. Who knew that Teddy would love the new nickname and insist everyone call him Bear from then on? I'm going to have a talk with Gabriel, Ebby said. He's got to give me a new partner. As it turned out, the only thing Mr. Gabriel gave Ebby during their talk was a sermon about her Christian duty to be kind to the less fortunate and a lecture about the quote-unquote dignity of every human life. During the team icebreaker, a guessing game with Bible flashcards, Ebby strayed from Bear in between questions to check in on Destiny, who'd been lucky enough to get paired with Robbie. You two make a cute couple, Destiny said. Ebby Bear, that has a nice ring to it, actually. Robbie piled on. Looks like your boyfriend is the only one having fun playing this game. That was true. Bear had been the only one to laugh at all of Mr. Gabriel's corny jokes, and he'd been the only one in the class to know that John the Baptist didn't write the Gospel of John. Ebby, Bear said in a whisper that wasn't a whisper. It's our turn next. Mr. Gabriel was watching her from the front of the room with a disapproving look. Chill out, Bear, I'm coming. Ebby rolled her eyes at Destiny before heading back over to him. She spent the next two hours at Bear's side, trying her best to be patient. But after hearing Bear sing church songs out of tune, and after listening to Mr. Gabriel's talk about the Holy Spirit, she'd had enough with religion class and all Bear's questions. You want a piece of chocolate, Ebby? Do you believe in Santa? What do you want for Christmas, Ebby? You want to share my candy cane? Bear wasn't trying to be annoying. He was sweet, actually, trying to be her friend and to get her to like him. But every single thing he said might as well have been announced with a megaphone. And every time he spoke, her friends giggled or eye-rolled at her. She was becoming the punchline of their jokes. Eventually, Mr. Gabriel switched on a large-screen TV and announced they'd be watching Scrooge before bed. Who knew how many questions Bear would ask during the movie about the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, and how excited he'd be 
when Ebenezer Scrooge went from calling Christmas a humbug to wishing everyone a Merry Christmas, not to mention how much he loved Tiny Tim. Ebby stepped up to Mr. Gabriel. Can I sit with Pastel? I've been stuck with Bear all night. Mr. A Mr. Gabriel's eyes grew sad, and he stared behind her. She turned and came face to face with Bear. Mm -hmm. He must have heard what she'd said. He wasn't stupid, even though he slurred his words sometimes and seemed as naive as a third grader. Still, Bear must have known exactly what she'd meant. Mr. Gabriel diverted Bear to the floor with his pillow and then pulled Ebby aside. I'm praying that God will work in your heart tonight. You're a nice girl, Abigail, but you care too much about the approval of your friends. It's turning you away from the person God wants you to be. Ebby hated being lectured, but she couldn't deny that she'd hurt Bear's feelings. As the movie played and Scrooge learned that he'd be visited by three ghosts at 1, 2, and 3 a.m., Bear pouted beside her with his arms folded. He didn't even offer her an M&M when he opened his box of treats. When the first ghost showed up in Scrooge's bedroom, Ebby lay back on her pillow, exhausted. What a dumb movie. Even the ghosts weren't cool. The ghost of Christmas past was basically an old lady from the 1800s, dressed in a hat and parasol and puffy skirt. Ebby stuck her face in her pillow, and the room grew eerily quiet. When she turned over and opened her eyes, nearly everything and everyone had disappeared. The TV, Bear, Mr. Gabriel, the other kids. Only two people remained, Ebby and Pastel. Except her friend didn't look quite like herself. Pastel's hair, usually layered perfectly upon her shoulders, had been drawn up tight around her head in a bun. She wore an antique green hat and a frilly dress, and she held a lacy umbrella in her fist. Ebby stood and stared at her. What the heck? Why are you dressed up like that? Like what? Pastel glanced down at her outfit, and her eyes widened in surprise. She reached up and ripped the tiny hat from her head. I'm... What? How did... There could be no doubt. Pastel looked to be the spitting image of the ghost of Christmas past. Is this a dream? Ebby said. Pinch me. Pastel stepped over and slapped her instead. What did you do to me, Ebby? I'm frumpy. Ebby turned full circle, surveying the parish hall, entirely empty except for an old-fashioned clock upon the wall, which told the time, one o'clock in the morning, exactly on the dot. This is crazy, she said. Pastel stood beside her in a daze. Actually, what's crazy is that hospital room. Ebby looked around. What are you talking about? What hospital room? Pastel pointed to the doorway. The one behind that door. How do you know there's a hospital room behind that door? Pastel shrugged. The same way I know that I'm supposed to bring you there. Ebby shook her head. This is nuts. Are you in my dream, or am I in your dream? Pastel patted the front of her dress. Well, considering that I'm wearing a super uncomfortable corset under this dress... This better be your dream, otherwise it's the worst nightmare I've ever had. What do we do now? Pastel walked to the door and turned the knob. I guess we go inside this hospital room. Ebby paused a moment on the doorstep before following Pastel within. Sure enough, behind the door was a white-walled room with fluorescent lights, medical equipment, and a hospital bed. A man stood beside the mattress, where a woman lay with tears in her eyes. This must be your past, Ebby. She peered at the woman. Not my past. Don't you recognize that lady? That's Bear's mother. Pastel paused. Yeah, you're right. And that must be his dad. They seem really upset. They don't seem to know we're here, Ebby said. I wonder why. Duh. Haven't you ever seen a Scrooge movie? They can't see us because we're like ghosts. Bear's mother reached up and took her husband's hand. I can't do it, Ted. I just can't. You heard the doctor, he said. What kind of life would he have if he were born? And what would our lives be like? The only merciful thing to do is to take care of this now. Then we can try again. Ebby turned to Pastel. The doctor told them to get rid of their baby? Last month, Eddie had, been, had seen a headline 
that said almost 90% of unborn babies with Down syndrome were being aborted. That must have been the same choice that Bear's parents had to make. Castell started to twirl. Do what I'm doing. Abby watched as her friend spun around three times. Finally, Pastel stopped and shook her head. I told you to twirl. Whatever, just look around. They were still in a hospital room, but the equipment was different now, and there were balloons and flowers by the bed. The man and woman were the same, but now the woman in the bed held a swaddled baby with the sweetest smile Ebby had ever seen. The woman was smiling, too. Isn't he beautiful, Ted? He's perfect. The man's joy seemed genuine. Even though the baby's eyes showed the telltale signs of Down syndrome, that didn't seem to matter to Bear's parents any more. Their happiness was unmistakable. Come on, Pastel said. Where are we going? I think there's one more place to go before I leave. Wait till you see what's in the library. Carolyn Astle. Carolyn Astle. Eddie turned in a slow circle. Library? There wasn't a... Wait. Where did that door come from? Pastel grabbed Eddie's hand, dragging her towards an ornate door, opened just enough for warm light to spill under the dull wooden planks before it. Eddie expected floor-to-ceiling shelves, a fancy chandelier, and proper high-backed chairs positioned around an ornate rug, maybe a candle or two lighting the recesses of the room, something that looked like it belonged in the board game Clue. Instead, she found the local library with its low metal shelves brightly colored posters and story time circle with a white wooden rocker positioned at the front. She glanced back, searching for the rest of the library, the reading room, the computer stations, but spotted only the ornate door, which clicked closed behind them. Pastel rushed forward and plopped onto a square pillow, like a preschooler. In fact, there were preschoolers all around, each taking a place on a pillow. Some clung to their moms, some boldly took a place at the front of the room. Ebby, caught in an odd wave of nostalgia, positioned a maroon pillow between Pastel and another little girl with two high ponytails and a long knit dress. The librarian, good old Mrs. Stolen, sunk into the rocker, her weight causing the chair's frame to creak as she gently rocked. From the floor, she selected their first book, a picture book adaption of, what else, Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Nothing subtle about this stream. Mrs. Stolen quieted the room with a rhyme and a song then launched into the book. Pastel stared at the book, seeming enraptured by the story. Ebby craned her neck, trying to see over the red-haired boy kneeling on the pillow in front of her. If only he'd sit down. He must have been blocking the view of the ponytailed girl next to her, because she was inching into Ebby's face. An elbow whacked Ebby in the chest. Hey! she cried, her ribs smarting and tears stinging her eyes. Ponytail girl glared at her, shoving her way onto Ebby's pillow, apparently supposing the view from there would be better. Where were the parents? Why hadn't Mrs. Stolen noticed? Pastel was still oblivious, lost in the story, or the loose thread at the hem of her dress, hard to tell which. Ponytail girl shoved, then snatched the pillow from beneath Ebby's bottom. She yanked the pillow hard, leaving Ebby on the hard floor, her upturned dress exposing her tights, her feet in the air. Ooh, the nerve of that little girl. A chubby hand thrust into her line of sight, palm up, and fingers extended with a pinky curled inward, as if to help her up. Ebby's gaze traveled up the arm to find a fuzzy-headed, chubby little boy. Bear. Bear smiled wide, revealing a mouthful of white baby teeth beneath his flattened nose. Are you okay? Ebby glanced again at his hand, then accepted it, allowing Bear to hoist her up and onto a pillow. A green one, that was apparently his. His kindness caused a little twinge in her chest. Bear had come to her aid, treating her with kindness, and how had she treated him in return? There was no time to think, because the story time had ended, and Pastel was hurrying her toward the exit, the frills of her dress snagging on the tip of her lacy umbrella. Hurry up! We've got to get to the ice rink on time. They've only got the ice for an hour. She commenced her crazy twirling again, motioning Ebby to do the same. Wait, what? Ice rink? Ebby hadn't been skating in years. In fact, she could barely stand in figure skates, her weak ankles wobbling and twisting as she slid along the boards, trying to keep her balance. As they crossed the threshold from the library to the ice rink, how did that happen? Pastel's frills disappeared, replaced by skinny jeans and a cropped sweater. Oh, no, Ebby said, nodding a protest before they'd even reached the ice. I'm not skating. I'm terrible at it, and we're not here to skate, Pastel said, a twinkle in her eye. You're here to watch. It's almost time. 
She glanced at the large clock mounted on the far wall, two o'clock, then faced the rink, watching the skaters from behind the glass streak with puck marks. Leslie Wall. Something suddenly slammed into the glass divider right next to Ebby. She jumped, her head swiveling just in time to see a face smashed against the glass. She instinctively took a step back, not quite trusting the clear layer of protection. The distorted face was clearly that of a teenage boy. While unrecognizable in its almost cartoonish current state, Ebby did recognize the boy's accomplice, who had apparently smashed his friend into the glass. It was Josh Greenlee, the captain of the school's hockey team. Ebby had no idea how she and Pastel had gotten there, but who cared? The hockey team was full of cute, popular athletes, making this much more enjoyable than hanging out with a bunch of preschoolers. She sat down into one of the rinkside seats, ready to cheer on the team. Are we here to watch a hockey game? Not exactly, Pastel answered. Want some? Pastel was suddenly sitting next to Ebby, holding a bag of popcorn. Ebby reached in to grab a handful of the buttery snack, thankful that this dream was of the full-service variety. Traveling through time sure made a girl hungry. The skirmish in front of them soon ended with the two jocks playfully punching each other before skating to the center of the rink, where the rest of their team was gathered. It dawned on Ebby that while all the guys were wearing skates, none of them had on their hockey pads or uniforms. If we're not here to watch them play, what are we doing? Ebby turned toward Pastel, who was now sipping a steaming hot cocoa. Ebby glanced around, wondering why no one had brought her one. Maybe the service in this dream wasn't so great after all. Pastel let out an effervescent giggle. You're so impatient, just wait. Ebby turned her attention back to the large group of muscular jocks, that's when she noticed a familiar face entering the rink. There. He was decked out in a Santa hat, a large, bulky sweater decorated with Rudolph's smiling face and bright green mittens. Ebby cringed, watching Bear make his way toward Josh and the huddle of athletes. Ebby had no idea what he thought he was doing, but she knew nothing good could come from mixing a bunch of cool jocks with one awkward bear. She called out his name to somehow stop him from whatever was bound to happen, but no one seemed to hear her yell. Instead, Ebby helplessly watched as Bear skated with outstretched arms toward the popular athletes. A few stared at him while others shook, shook their heads. Uh, one jerk snatched the Santa hat from Bear's head. Bear made a grab for it, but not before the hat was tossed to one of the jerk's teammates. Despite Ebby's inability to skate, she felt the need to rescue Bear from the humiliating game of keep-away unfolding before her. Sure, Bear could be annoying, but he didn't deserve to have the whole team picking on him. She thought back to, res she thought back to him rescuing her from the bratty little girl and wanted to somehow return the favor. But before she could make a move, Josh snagged the Santa hat out of the air, tousled Bear's head, then handed it back to its rightful owner. Josh and Bear shared a fist bump. Were they having fun together? Here they come, Pastel's enthusiasm pulled Ebby out of her contemplation. She followed her friend's gaze to the side of the rink where a gaggle of little kids and their parents made their way toward the ice. A closer look revealed that the kids of various ages all had some kind of disability. Ebby watched in disbelief as each one of the teenage boys helped a smaller child skate around the ice. Some, including Bear, were pushing wheelchairs. Others were helping their pint-sized partners navigate little walkers around the ice. And some, like Josh, were simply holding hands, offering a bit of stability for their wobbly churches. What is this? Ebby pulled her gaze from the sight in front of her to look at Pastel. Her eyes widened to now observe Pastel munching on a perfectly decorated sugar cookie. You're still eating? Pastel covered her mouth as she spoke. 
I was too busy chatting with Destiny and Robbie and never got a snack before we started watching the movie. Abby shook her head. Of course, this was the kind of dream guide she would get stuck with. Laughter and delightful squeals filled the arena as the children and their teen helpers swirled around the rink. Pastel finally finished chewing, wiping crumbs from the sides of her mouth. This is adaptive ice skating. Wow, I've never heard of it. That's really nice the hockey team is letting Bear help out. Pastel's laughter was light and bubbly. Bear's not just helping out. He is the one who organized the event. He and Josh were paired together on some project in school, and Bear kept talking about how much they had in common since they both liked to skate. He thought it would be fun to let the kids who might not otherwise ever skate have a chance to enjoy it. So he asked his new hockey player friend to help. Ebby turned back to the happy children. Pure joy radiated from their smiling faces. The hockey team all seemed to be having a great time as well. Bear's huge smile was contagious, causing Ebby to grin. When was the last time she'd ever been that happy? For that matter, when was the last time she'd truly helped someone? Ebby jumped up, reaching out a hand to her friend. Let's go join them. Pastel shook her head as somewhere a clock struck three. Nope, time to move on. Ebby did a double take and gaped at her friend. What on earth are you wearing now? Rena Turner. Ebby jerked awake with the image of an older pastel dancing wildly in a nightclub while dressed in a skin-tight puke green bodysuit burned indelibly into her brain and actually found herself praying, though what she prayed was, Lord, please don't let that be a real glimpse of future fashion. Then she came fully awake and raised her head from her pillow, shaking her head to dismiss her foolishness. What a weird dream. She was kind of curious what the future visions would have been. I mean, this was a church retreat. Maybe the whole dream was divinely inspired. Oh well. Bear still sat beside her, staring rapt at the screen as other kids whispered to one another or watched the movie more half-heartedly. Huh? Where were Pastel, Destiny and Robbie? Getting up quietly, she left the hall heading for the restroom. No sign of Pastel or Destiny there. As she wandered along the corridor, she caught a faint sound from the janitor's closet and pulled the door open. Pastel, Destiny and Robbie looked up at her with amusing expressions of alarm, then relaxed when they saw it was her. They were sitting around a metal garbage can with smoke and flames rising from the top. Shut the door quick, hissed Robbie. We don't want to set off the smoke detector. The alarm was all Ebby's now. What are you... Destiny held up a bag of marshmallows. We're making s'mores. Pastel waved a packet of graham crackers. Glad you escaped the retard long enough to join us. You shouldn't call him that. The words were out before Ebby could think. Pastel raised an eyebrow. Call a spade a spade. That's what my dad says. Come on, you deserve an hour off, said Destiny. You've been an unpaid special ed teacher all evening. I'm not even sure he's in special ed, Evie muttered. Part of her wanted to sit down with her friends and have fun, but part of her felt like lighting a fire inside a building crossed some line she didn't want to cross. And, and part of her just didn't want to be here right now. Uh, I wish I could, she found her mouth saying. But I'm actually going to go watch the rest of the movie. Then I don't have to read A Christmas Carol for English Lit. Pastel raised an eyebrow again, even more cuttingly. Yeah, because you were paying so much attention before. Ebby withdrew quickly, feeling a pang as she closed the door. She'd annoyed them by refusing to stay. What if they didn't want to be friends anymore? But as she walked back to the hall... She couldn't shake the vision of Pastel at the ice rink, praising Bear's initiative and feeling such obvious pressure at watching the disabled children skating. Why couldn't her best friend be like that in real life? Glumly, she flopped back down on her pillow. Want an M&M? &M? Bear's too loud whisper made her jump slightly. Er, uh, 
Thanks. Was she forgiven? How sweet he was. Maybe she was glad she'd called Pastel out for using that horrible word, even if it had made her mad at her. Bear became reabsorbed in the movie as she munched her handful of candy. But after a few minutes, he leapt up with a huge, tragic sigh and darted from the room, clearly determined to use the restroom absolutely as fast as possible and not miss anything. Ebby couldn't help a quieter sigh, envying him his enjoyment. But it was no use. She couldn't get into this movie. The ghost of Christmas future was making her eyes heavy. So heavy. She opened her eyes with a clear sense that she was back in her dream. She looked around. Where was Pastel, her guide? They were in a cool, pale blue room. Flowers stood in a corner, and soft music played from somewhere. There were Pastel's mum and dad, looking somewhat older. Oh no! Pastel's mum was sobbing, and Ebby's mum was there, patting her shoulder. I'm sure it was just a terrible accident, Ebby's mum whispered. A mistake. Nothing more. Heart pounding, Ebby turned around. A casket, open, and inside, the room spun. No, Ebby was spinning, three times, round and round, unable to help herself. She was walking along a street, alone, crying. Because of Pastel? No, that was several years ago. She was in her mid-twenties now. Her boyfriend had broken up with her. Yet another relationship, over. Why did this keep happening to her? Ebby, her mom had stared at her so solemnly after Ebby sobbed that very question. You need to look for the authentic in people. Image just isn't enough. How could her mom be so cruel when Ebby's heart was breaking? Of course she cared about authenticity. What was wrong with wanting some cool factor too? But she couldn't shake the word from her mind as she walked. Authentic. Almost unwilled, her feet paused outside the local church. From the number of cars in the parking lot, there was a mass in progress. She hadn't been to mass for so long. Authentic. Where could she find that? A moment later, she found herself slipping into the rear pew of the church. Oh, white flower arrangements decorated every pew end, and at the altar rail stood two figures in smart suits. Was this a wedding? Music began. Ebby rose to her feet with the congregation, looking around to see the bride entering. A slightly plump young woman with a moon-shaped face it took Ebby a moment to realise what was different about her. Her eyes. She had Down syndrome. Ebby did a double take. Yep. Dressed in a slightly over-the-top white bridal gown, she swayed down the aisle as though revelling in every ruffle. She was definitely the bride. I didn't even know people with Down syndrome got married, thought Ebby, hot with embarrassment. At the front of the church, the groom turned, a beaming smile on his familiar face as he watched his bride approaching. Bare. Older, but clearly bare. Ebby's heart jolted with an unexpected surge of happiness. Oh, I hope this is real. Suddenly she was spinning again, helplessly, like a top. Ugh, she missed having a guide. She stumbled dizzily as a new room appeared around her, very conscious of how alone she was and how clueless this room was pastel colours again, pale green, cold, sterile. A simple bed, a desk, a chair, all in an unfamiliar style. Bear stood in front of the bed, much older, his eyes wide, as he faced a man and a woman, both dressed in some kind of medical uniform. The fear in his expression, in his tense stance, chilled Ebby inside. Now that your mother has passed, the state has some responsibility for you, which is why we brought you and your wife here for assessment, the man was saying. Obviously, with your limitations, it is not possible for you to have the same quality of life as other people, so there is only one compassionate course of action. However, since you and your wife reach a basic level of mental capacity, it is necessary for you to give consent by signing this form. There shook his head shrinking away from the form as the man held it out. I have the best quality of life. Please let me and Alice go home. 
Now you shouldn't be selfish about this, said the woman. Aren't you aware what a burden you are to society with your higher medical needs? I am not a burden, said Bear, in that slow, decided way of his. I work a job. I look after Alice. I won't sign that. Alice won't sign that. My mom, the last thing she told me was, Don't sign that form, Bear. You are not a burden. My mom taught me my rights. You have to let us go. The man sighed, shaking his head, while the woman tutted. Evie was so close to them, she heard the man mutter. This is precisely why we need further extension of the compassion law. Evie began to spin again. Her last glimpse before everything blurred was of Bear, his back to that bed, terror in his eyes. A deafening siren snapped Evie awake. All around her, people screamed, stumbling over pillows as they ran in all directions. The dim glow of emergency lights illuminated a few parts of the hall, but everything else was dark. Half asleep, she tried to flounder up from her pillow, but a foot smacked into her head, sending her back to the floor in a daze. Smoke, smoke burned down her windpipe into her lungs as she struggled up and onto her feet. How long had she been lying there? Everyone was gone. No sound but the siren, the fire alarm, and an ominous crackling in the distance. She stumbled forward, coughing, arms outstretched. Where was the door? She couldn't see anything. Smoke burned her eyes. Her chest heaved in between spasms of coughing as she tried to get enough air. Where was the door? She had to find it. Oh, God, please help me. Suddenly, a hand gripped her ankle, then reached up to grasp her hand, pulling her down to the floor. Crawl, Ebby! Bear's familiar, slightly strident voice reached her over the noise of the alarm. Keep low! Follow me! Keep low! Belatedly, Ebby remembered this was the right thing to do in a fire. Yes, the smoke was much thinner down here. She could just see Bear's feet moving in front of her, and crawled as quickly as she could to keep them in sight. How did he even know where he was going? But before long she heard a creaking sound, and smoke suddenly rushed out past her through open doors as she followed Bear on to tarmac. The parking lot, they were out. Coughing, sucking in great breaths of fresh air, she crawled a few more feet and collapsed on her side. Bear stopped beside her, still on hands and knees, coughing just as hard, tears running down his face from his red, watering eyes. There they are, someone screamed. Mr. Gabriel, they're out. He found her. Thank God, the teacher's voice reached Ebby's ears a moment before the man himself. Teddy, Abigail, are you all right? Things were a blur for a while. Eventually, Ebby found herself sitting in the back of an ambulance, being encouraged to breathe in oxygen from a little face mask. Through the open rear doors, she could see the parish hall, engulfed in flames. Firefighters aimed to jet the water into the building as they struggled to bring the blaze under control. As the oxygen cleared her smoky mind, her heart sank lower and lower. What would happen to Pastel, Destiny and Robbie? After a while, a paramedic checked her vitals again, smiled, took the oxygen mask away, and said she could get out of the ambulance and sit in the fresh night air. The flames were finally dying down, and what smoke still rose was blowing the other way. Ebby settled on a parish picnic bench, staring at the smouldering hall in numb horror. Should she have told Mr. Gable about the fire? Her friends would have been in so much trouble, they'd never have forgiven her. Speak of the devil. Ebby, are you okay? Pastel plunked down on the bench on the opposite side of the table, staring at her. Yeah, I'm fine. They think I won't have to go to the hospital. She could see Bear standing by the other ambulance, sucking a lollipop and chatting to the paramedics and looking okay. So hopefully that went for him too. Did he come back in to find her? Good, sighed Destiny. What's going to happen? asked Ebby uneasily. Are you going to be in terrible trouble? Nope, said Robbie, grinning like they hadn't just accidentally burned down an entire building. I told Mr. Gabriel I saw the retard playing of a lighter near the janitor's closet, 
so we won't get the blame at all. What? Ebby stared at him. But there will be in huge trouble. Better him than us, said Destiny. Yeah, said Pastel. They'll just send him to an institution or something, which is where he belongs anyway. No harm done. Ebby couldn't speak, her head swimming as though she'd been breathing in smoke again. How could they think what they were doing was okay? Abigail, Mr. Gable approached with two firefighters beside him and shooed Pastel, Destiny and Robbie away. You're the last one in the building. Can you speak to these officers for a moment? His eyes darted to where Bear was now crying and waving his arms wildly as two more firefighters vigorously interrogated him. A pair of cops stood nearby, watching like they were waiting to be asked to do something. Uh, sure, said Ebby. Do you know where Teddy Jenkins was when the fire started? One officer asked immediately. Ebby glanced at Bear again, then at Mr. Gabriel. The teacher met her eyes solemnly. Her insides churned the way they had on that horribly rough boat trip she'd once been on. She would lose her friends if she told the truth. Authentic. That was another word for truth, right? She looked at Bear again. Bear, who had just saved her life, and who was ten times nicer than anyone else she knew. She took a deep breath, and prayed a genuine prayer for the first time in years, since frivolous prayers while half asleep, and prayers while in mortal peril didn't really count, right? Lord, please help me to be authentic. She'd closed her eyes. She opened them and met Mr. Gabriel's eyes again. When I went to the restroom, I found Pastel, Destiny and Robbie in the janitor's closet. They were cooking s'mores on a fire in a garbage can. No going back now. Mr. Gabriel frowned. The firefighters scowled. One of them rose to his feet and strode straight over to Teddy, said something to the men interrogating him, who shut up at once. Mr. Gabriel met her eyes again. I'm sorry you didn't tell me before, Abigail, but thank you for telling me now. It was very brave of you. He rose to his feet and went to join the firemen, putting his arm around Bear in a quick hug. Pastel, Destiny, Robbie, will you come here for a minute, please? His voice cut through all the noise. Ebby, Ebby, they know it wasn't my fault. Isn't it wonderful? Teddy hurried across to her, shouting excitedly. He settled on the bench, fumbling in his pocket. Ebby, I've still got a few M&Ms. Do you want some? Pastel and Destiny slowly approached Mr. Gabriel and the firefighters, staring at Ebby with the most vicious expressions she'd ever seen on their faces. Robbie moved that way, then seemed to panic, suddenly sprinting for the parking lot gateway. The two cops moved even faster, and soon he was being marched back to join the other two. Ebby stared at the M&Ms Teddy had tipped into her hand, feeling too sick to eat them. But what else could she have done? Watched a lie play out and destroy an innocent life? She'd done the right thing. Now it was too late to change anything. She actually felt an odd sense of relief that the relaxed friendships were over. Because they hadn't been authentic, had they? It had taken Bear and a weird dream and a fire to make her face up to that. Do you like authenticity, Bear? It was a stupid thing to say, but the words just blurted out. Sure, a big smile spread over his face. Authentic means honest. Honest is good. Everyone should be honest. Yeah, if everyone was honest, maybe the world would be a happier place. Maybe, just maybe, if they could all be authentic enough, only the good parts of her dream would come true. She popped an M&M &M into her mouth as the clock struck midnight and smiled at her new friend. Happy St. Nicholas's Day, Bear. Happy St. Nicholas's Day, Ebby. The end. Beautiful ending. Yes, yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What a great story. And what a great way to celebrate Christmas. We want to thank our friends at CatholicTeenBooks.com. Anthony Conlink, Leslie Wall, Corinna Turner, Carolyn Asphalt. What a beautiful story they created for us. 
really entertaining and giving us lots to think about on this beautiful Christmas Day 2022. We hope you have a beautiful Christmas. We hope you and your family are filled with the joy of, of Christmas, filled with hope and love. In addition to our authors, I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Stephanie Davila, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the joy she brings to me on Christmas and every single day of my life. But most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.